Hi, I'm Rob Cosman. Welcome to my shop. I'm going to show you how to make breadboard table ends. For years, this has been one of the preferred methods of keeping a wide, solid wood top from cupping as it goes through the various cycles in humidity. If you've ever wondered how to do it, stay with us. I'm going to show you. I'm Rob Cosman, and welcome to my shop. We make it our job to help take your woodworking to the next level. If you're new to our channel, make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell, which will alert you whenever we release a new video. Anytime we use a new tool or technique, we'll leave a description down below so that make it easier for you to find. All right, let's get back to work. Let's start by explaining the problem. What I have in front of me is a piece of northern white pine. It's 19 and an eighth of an inch wide. Now the problem is that if you were to put that in your house, unsupported, meaning four legs perhaps underneath, as the humidity changes from one season to the next and the wood is going to absorb or give off moisture, it has a tendency sometimes to cup. Cup means moving like this. So what do you do and how do you deal with it? The other reason that we use a breadboard end, I think some people didn't like to look at the end grain on the end of a piece of board. I can't really imagine that since I think any part of the wood is great, but there was a time when they didn't want to see that. So, let me show you this first. And a lot of folks I don't think fully understand this. You can prevent this board from cupping quite easily. It's not hard. What you can't prevent it from doing is expanding as the moisture in the atmosphere around it increases or from shrinking as the, as the moisture in the atmosphere re uh, reduces. If you look at these two pieces of wood, this is a piece of pine in its length, came out of the tree like that. Here's a piece of pine across its width. Both are three quarters of an inch thick, both are two inches wide. If I take this piece, see how easily I can bend it? Very easily. It would take nothing whatsoever to keep that nice and flat. Here's a piece running in the opposite direction and there's no way I could bend that. In fact, if I really hit it hard, I might be able to break it. I could snap that by just leaning on it a little bit. So you can prevent a board from cupping and keeping it, and you can keep it flat across its widths. How do we do it? Well, on a breadboard end, you simply have what we call a tenon or a tongue on the end, cut back a little bit from either end. You have another piece in its length, which is nice and strong, and you cut a matching groove in it, stopping short on both ends. You always have to make sure that this tongue is not as wide as this groove because it's got to be able to expand out. And when you fasten that on, that will then keep that top from moving. But you have to fasten it carefully and you also have to prevent it from restricting any movement. In other words, that tongue inside of that groove can't be glued because it has to al allow it to expand and contract. But because the tongue is sitting in this groove with a nice snug fit, it prevents any of that cupping that we were talking about. So what I want to do is walk you through the process of taking something from this and getting it to this. And we'll also show you how we can fasten this piece so it stays nice and tight. There's a couple of different methods that we can use. I'll explain both of them to you. Now I'm going to cut what we would call the mortise, or in this case the groove, first. And you'll notice I don't go all the way to the end. Obviously I don't want to see it out there. And you need to leave enough material in here to give that some strength. And if it's a hard wood, you can get away with less. If it's a soft wood, you're going to want a little bit more. So what I've done is left three-eighths of an inch. And the reason why I don't want to leave too much is because I want to be able to grab or support as far out on the either, either edge of the table as possible. So the shorter we make, the more material we may leave here, the farther in we have to bring that tongue from either edge. So I'm just going to use this as a template. Now we'll bring that in three-eighths on both sides. I suppose we could have just measured in three-eighths of an inch from the top as well. Okay, now as far as depth, I made this one three-quarter, so I'm going to make the part of the table, the tenon portion, just a little bit less than that, just so I don't have to worry about it bottoming out. So I'm going to set this height for 
uh, just a little more than 11 sixteenths. Now, first thing I want to do is mark where the blade first starts to touch the wood. I'll put a mark on here, and then I'm going to go to the other end and do the same thing. A mark right there. Then I'll come over here just to make it a little more pronounced. Okay. I'm going to... Uh, something else that I do a little bit different. Normally when you're doing a mortise and tenon, you're going to go a third, third, and a third. Meaning, if you're dealing with three-quarter inch material, you're going to have one wall a third of the thickness, which would be a quarter, and then your opening or your mortise would be a quarter, and then the other wall would be a quarter. And then when you do the tongue or the tenon, you would have a shoulder that's a quarter, you would have the tenon, which is a quarter, and of course the other side would be a quarter. I'd like to leave a little more than that, so I'm actually going to go with 5 sixteenths for the uh, width of my gap or my tongue. So, since I'm dealing with material that measures 13 sixteenths, I'm going to bring this over so that the distance between the outside or my right side of that tooth and the fence is going to be just a little bit stronger in a quarter. I'm going to do it a couple of times to fine tune it. Now, I need to know where to stop and where to start. So if I line this up and then put a block back here and clamp it in place and then when I go forward if I line up where the saw stops cutting with the mark that I made and I'll put a block on the other end and then clamp that in place. Now, I'll hold it like that, set it down. It, does, it won't kick back on me. Move forward till I get here. I can lift it up. I'll flip it around and just keep doing that until I get the width that I want. All right, I've got my height set. I know where it starts and where, it, or where the, uh, the two ends are going to be, where, where the blade will make, stop making contact. I'll turn this on and I'll start these cuts. Flip it over. Now I didn't get rid of that material in the middle, so I'm going to move that a little farther over. We'll pick that up. Okay. Check our gap. It's not quite what I want, so we're going to bring this over a little bit more. Actually, I'm going to shut that down so I can measure it. So if I measure what I have right now, I have a strong quarter. I'm going to go for a weak quarter. So I'll set my fence so that my tooth is just inside the quarter inch mark. And that'll give me a little more meat in the middle. Actually measuring almost three eighths, but I'm all right. I'm, I'm okay with that. All right. Now what we want to do is clean out these ends. You can do it with a chisel. Or we can do it with a hollow chisel mortiser. I'll show you how that works. So the first thing I want to do is get my depth just right. So I'll set that down to the bottom. And what you would do is simply loosen this 
And then when that rod touches, that's your depth. We want, I'm not gonna to try to take two passes with this simply because there's not enough material supporting the chisel all the way around. So if you were to take one full pass and then take another partial pass, sometimes the chisel wants to slide over into there and it's not good for a small chisel like that. So what I'm gonna do instead is just take one pass out of the middle and I'll clean up what's left with a chisel, regular beveled edge chisel. So I've got that right in the middle, lock that. This keeps it from pulling up. And I'll simply come over here and hit it on the line. And then I'll take a full pass, meaning full width of the chisel. And I'll just keep going along. I'm dealing with the curvature of the blade, so I've got to come out here a little ways. Now, with most of that material out, we can go over to the bench, and with a beveled edge chisel, we can clean it up, and it'll take us a few minutes. This one doesn't have much material on it at all, so what I'm gonna do is lay that chisel against that cheek, and just pare straight down. I don't wanna make it any wider, but I don't want it to be any narrower. Now, I'll come in here and make a cut. And this is mild enough wood that it's easy to force the chisel through just by hand. No need for a mallet. Now there's a little more material on the other side. So what I'm gonna do is start right about here and make cuts at about eighth inch intervals, staying tight to this wall closest to me. I eventually get to that back line, make that pass. Now I can come in and do the same thing, keep the chisel tight to that already cut wall. We'll come along the bottom. Now I think there's a little bit of curvature left, so I'm just going to use my chisel with the bevel down, that way I can control the depth and just go along. So I'm riding along this flat part and then just picking up any of that radius that's left because of the blade, table saw blade. Now remember, we're not going to bring the tenon all the way over to here. We're going to keep that back about 3 16ths of an inch and that's going to be where that will allow it to expand need be. Okay, we'll do the same thing on the other end. Okay, so there's my breadboard end cleaned out. We still have to plane it, clean it up a little bit on the outside, but the inside is ready. So now we can go and cut the tongue or the tenon on the end of that large tabletop and get that to fit. So the table saw is still where it was when we cut that groove. So if we leave it right like that, it'll give us the same length tongue. But I'm gonna drop it down just a bit so that the tongue ends up being just a little bit shorter. And again, I don't have to worry about it bottoming out and I don't have to go in there and clean that out. It'll also allow me to take a couple of passes with the plane to clean that up without having to worry about having it bottom out. So what I'm gonna do is I have to figure out what my, my uh, depth, um, how wide this tongue has to be in order to fit in there and then work backwards. So I'm gonna shoot for 3 eighths of an inch and uh, I'll, I prefer to finish that up with a router plane so I can get it 
just the right fit. So if we were to go three-eighths of an inch, this piece measures 11 sixteenths. So what I'm going to do is simply move it so that we have a sixteenth and a half on either side. And that puts our middle, that could be a little sharper, puts our middle right there. And if we're gonna go three-eighths on either side, three-eighths means three-sixteenths over here, and three-sixteenths over here. So we want to set our table saw. I'm gonna say safely we want three-sixteenths of an inch. So we're gonna measure from the outside, the left side of the saw blade to the fence. And we want that to measure three-sixteenths of an inch. Okay, now I'm going to use these feather boards to help keep that tight. Now this is my auxiliary fence, but when you're cutting something tall like this, it's nice to have all that extra reference surface instead of a regular fence, which is only about half of that amount. So I'll put this right there, push it in, and then back here we want about the same amount. Take a quick look at that. Yeah, we've got too much material. We've got to take some more off of that. So we'll move that over about a 30 second. I'd rather do this three or four times and sneak up on it and get it right than to try to get it the first time and end up making it too narrow and then you've got to either start over or glue pieces back on. Okay, that's really close. I'm gonna leave it at that. All right, take this apart. We gotta go in and we gotta cut our shoulders. And this is just gonna be a bit of trial and error. I'm not worrying about that little thin piece being trapped. It's too uh, small to cause any kind of a problem. Okay, we're not, we're not up deep enough. We're only about a third of what we need. You can see that our still about as fat 16 shy. never want to do that where the piece of wood was big enough to 
cause a problem. Something light like that is okay. Now I didn't get all the way into the corner, but I can do that up with a chisel. I'm gonna trim this to size. Now remember, we can't have this bottoming out on the on these ends either because then there's no room for it to expand. It defeats the whole purpose. So if we put that in place, so there's where the end of our um, breadboard end is. And now you're gonna figure we need about that much for expansion. So we'll come over here and do the same thing on this end. So a square line across the end and then run one up that face. Do the same thing over here. Now, as big as this table is, I find it a lot easier to take care of that with a hand saw than to try to hold it up on the table saw. I always like to have that set and level. Now I'm gonna use a crosscut saw. And I'll come in and trim that with a chisel. Now while I have this up on its end, I'm gonna go in and clean up those corners. The first thing I'll do is reference off of this shoulder that I've created in the table saw. And just swing right around. Make sure I don't have any material sticking up too high right there. So what I'll do, I actually prefer to do it on this side. I'm gonna hold the chisel up against the cheek. Let that back corner drag and just run right along there like that. That'll finish that cut to the bottom. Now when I get here, just turn around, do the same thing the other direction. Then referencing off of this shoulder, come in and do the same thing. Let that rear corner drag. All right, now we need to find out how much we've got to take off in order to get that to fit. That's not bad. I'm gonna cut a little chamfer right there on the top edge to make it a little easier to squeeze it in. Not too much, just enough to ease that lead edge in. I don't want to spread these, so it can't be it can't be too tight. And that's that's too snug. So we've got to take a little bit off. The easiest way to do that is with a router plane. So let me clean up okay, my this bench. is what we call a router plane. This one's made by Lee Nielsen. I added a base to it just to give me a little more reference when we use it in an application like this where there's no support out here and the blade shape is wanting to pull like this. I've got lots of reference now. So what we want to do is just check this to see. It's just a little variation in the depth of that. So we'll come here, this seems to be a low point. I like to actually adjust it under a bit of tension here so that it, it doesn't fall. You've got to force whatever adjustment you make. Now you can use a regular router, but it's noisy. And I find this 
hand router a lot easier to control. And you can dial it in quite easily to take that last little tiny bit. Okay, now I suspect we gotta take a little more off, but before I check it, or before I turn over and do the other side, I'm gonna take this and check it and see if we're any closer. Now, I don't want to be fooled by the natural cup that's already in this board, which is going to make this feel a little bit tight. So I'll do the other side. Want to get right into that corner. And I suspect that'll be just the fit we're looking for. That's good. Okay, so now we have to secure it. There's two ways we can do it. The first way is we'll put a little bit of a radius like this on the breadboard end. Then we put it in place. We'll actually glue it right in the center, not much, maybe just an inch or so. Glue it. And of course, just putting it on like that is going to leave a little bit of a gap right there. So what we would do is put a large clamp and stretch it and push this in until this is tight. And because of that little bit of a radius, we've now put these outside ends under a lot of tension, which will keep that nice and tight. You'll never have a gap there. We'll glue that, and then we'll put a pin in from the other side, from the underside, the side you're not gonna see, and it'll, we'll purposely drill through the cheek, through the tongue, and parsley into this cheek, but not all the way through. Before I do that, I would go in and clean this up. And by that, I mean, plane that surface and I would plane this one as well but I'm just going to show you how we actually do that process so let me grab a, uh, a drill okay, we need to prepare this that's going to be nice and square so the first thing I want to do is use my shooting board I don't think that's too long you know, I can still do it and I want to square up this edge and also clean it up get rid of all the mill marks We want these edges to be nice and sharp because they'll show well when they come up against those shoulders. Okay, let's check this. That looks good. So now what we need to do is come in here and a little bit of a radius. Now I'm gonna use my Big number eight as a guide. I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to use my block plane to make the cut. We have to have a short soled plane, or else it's going to, it's, this is too long in order for us to give a bit of a radius on the inside. The first thing I want to do is check this. Okay, we actually have a little bit of a bump, so we want to take care of that. I want to make sure that this is cutting square, so I'll grab another piece of wood to check that on. Okay, what I did is just ran that a couple of times, check it, and it's square. So we'll come in here. Now it'll make it a little bit easier if we mark our center. So this is 19 and a quarter long. So we're just back right here, 9 and 7 eighths. 
double check that, and that was wrong. 19 and a quarter. 19 and a quarter is going to be 9 and 5 eighths. So if that's our middle, and then we'll go 3 inches out from either side, and then another 2 inches beyond that. Okay, so we'll start here. You didn't get rid of that hump. Yeah. Now the secret to this is to exit while you're still in motion. I'm going to come back to the middle. Let's see what we got. Okay, now the fact that it wiggles like this means it doesn't touch in the middle. It's only pivoting from the outside edges. And uh, seeing as it's pine, it's going to bend quite easily. I'm going to do this again, make it a little bit more. I'll start two inches either side of center, two inches this side of center, and I'll go to there. So when I say you have to be careful when you do this, you want to be in a forward motion when you disengage. In other words, you leave a little skin tag on there. And one more pass, almost to either end. Make sure I can't feel any marks. Set that on there. So now I got a little better gap in there. We'll actually try that and see how it works. Hopefully we didn't take so much off those cheeks that we, that we um, made it so that this would bottom out. If it is, we could just go ahead and plane it off a little bit. Put this back on while we have the advantage of the vise pulling it flat. Now, bring this up on the bench. We have a good side. Now what I want to do is put a clamp on here and pull that in and then just get some idea of how much tension there is holding that. Pull that in. So the gap is nice and tight all the way along. And I, there's no way that I can pull that apart. So that would work just great. Now, next thing we would do, decide which of these tops, which of these surfaces is gonna be the top. I think this would be, it looks a little bit better. So from the bottom side, I'm gonna find my halfway mark, which was nine and five eighths, right? Okay, our tongue was 11 sixteenths, so that puts it right there. So if we drill our hole right here, we should be good. So what we need to do, now I would glue that if I was finished with this, but I'm going to want to be able to take it apart because this needs to be finished before we put the end cap on. Pull some tension on that, keep it nice and tight. Now this is awkward to try to take under the drill press, so what I use is my, my uh, drilling guide, and I use it simply as a way of holding the bit square to the face. Uh, check this quick. So, just mark that. And taking into account the point, I'm going to get a piece of masking tape. And we can safely go down. We can go three quarters of an inch without worrying. So if I can find that mark again, right there. Oh, this isn't gonna work. 
But what I can do is put the masking tape on this side for right now. And I'll just put that much of it in the jaws. So when this bottoms out on there, I know I'm down safe distance. So that hole All right, there's a little bit of spring back there, but when we if we glue that inch or so, that would lock it and I wouldn't worry about that bouncing back. Let's flip this over and look at it from the good side. We that like I said, a little bit of glue in there to help hold that and lock it in place. Or we could have made the dowel. Dowel was, could have been just a little snugger, but I don't think it would be a real issue by the time you put some glue in there, put the dowel in, hold that clamp. Once it dries, that's not going to come back. Okay, now let's do a quick one on the other end. Another option. What we're going to do on this one as another means of holding these ends in tight is we're going to use three dowels. So we'll put one in the middle and then we'll come all the way over maybe about an inch, inch and a quarter in from the end. that about five uh, can we go three eighths I think we can so we'll come in here put a mark at the three eighths now I'm going to use an awl to start that hole Now, I'm going to take this one over to the drill press, since it's a lot more mobile, and we're going to drill that to right about there before we do anything. Okay, so we have three holes. This is on the underside. So put this in place, center it. Now, just to keep everything tight, I'm going to put a clamp on there. That's the bottom side, so we don't have to worry about it as much. You may, need, you may need a guide block if you've got a steady hand. You can use that hole that you just drilled as your guide. Careful when it pokes through. I'm going to move this out here so we have that same tight fit.
Okay. Now, it, we have to allow for movement out here. So we'll take this off. And you can use a router. If you're careful, you could use a, a rasp. But whatever we do, we've got to come in here and extend extend these holes into ovals. So I'll take my marking gauge and put it right at the bottom of that circle. Don't do the middle one. And I'll do the same thing at the top of the circle. So I would suggest we probably want to remove about that much. Clean up that backside. We would need to do the same thing on this side, but for demonstration purposes, we'll cut three dowel. Now, I would actually suggest that you go in and do the same thing. That doesn't hurt at all putting that slight radius. It just guarantees that these are going to stay nice and tight. We would glue again. If you glue from there to there, you're not going to run into a problem. We put this in place. Line up that center hole. So the center one is going to keep all of the movement. I'm just going to cut a little bevel on that. Now when we put this one in, it sits in that elongated hole, and as this center panel expands or contracts, that moves within that oval-shaped hole, keeping it nice and tight. That slight radius we put on this is going to do the best job. This is just a little extra security, and again, if you had that even wider, you might want to do that, and you could put it in several of them if you needed to. But that's a breadboard end. <laughs> 